بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد النبي وأزواجه أمهات المؤمنين وذريته وآل بيته كما صليت على آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد Dear brothers Inshallah today's khutbah will be a continuation of the subject we had started a few weeks back regarding the biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the last thing we had talked about was his participation in the rebuilding of the Kaaba. <coughs> then the scholars of Sirah, the biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talk about the most important incident in the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which is the beginning of revelation, Bad al Wahi. And this is, this is definitely the most important incident in the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is the most important incident probably in the history of mankind. The time where Allah Azza wa Jal bestowed his mercy and favor on humanity to bring them out from darkness into light with the final message that will last and prevail till the day of judgment. Before I delve into this subject, because we will rely and we always rely as Muslims on the narrations, the historical reports that were compiled and documented by our Muslim scholars, starting from the time of the Sahaba, Radwanullahi alayhim, may Allah be pleased with them, to their followers and successors, then to the compilers, big compilers of hadith like Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Abu Dawood and Nasa'i and so on, Tirmidhi, until today. Because our religion is based upon their documentation of everything that they had witnessed during the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is our religion. In al isnad min al deen this is what the scholars say. These chains of narration, we have to revere them because there's no other nation on earth that has been able to authenticate and document the history of their prophets as this nation did. And that is by the wisdom and the mercy and favor of Allah. Because otherwise this deen would have been lost. But it is Allah's decree to preserve this deen. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ Allah promised to preserve the dhikr, this reminder. And the reminder is not only the Qur'an, because the reminder is both the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everything that has happened during the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, everything that has come out of his mouth, every action, every approval, every conduct, during this blessed time, during these 23 years, it is what shapes our religion and forms and constitutes our religion. Because when you go on the social media, especially the internet, you will find the enemies of this religion, the people who hate this religion, the people who do not want this religion to lighten the way for humanity and enlighten the hearts and soften the hearts of people, those people, including atheists and missionaries from other religion, religions and apologists of other religions, those people, they spent their days and nights and their money to sway people away from the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah said this in the Quran and that's expected. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ 
ليصدوا عن سبيل الله the disbelievers they spend their wealth so that they divert people away from the sabilillah from the path of Allah Azza wa Jalla that's expected don't think there will come a day where those people will vanish don't expect that your path on this religion will always be paved so that there's no, no hindrance so that there's nobody raising doubts in your heart and mind this will always happen and this is your struggle and my struggle and this is the only way so that we can reach our final destination of peace and bliss and happiness beside Allah Azza wa Jal fi maqa'ad sidqin inda malik muqtadir am hasibtum an tadkhulu al-jannah wa lamma ya'lam Allah alladhina jahadu minkum wa ya'lam as-sabirin do you even expect to enter paradise jannah heaven before you show to Allah Azza wa Jal that you have made some form of striving jahadu to strive, to work hard, and persevere, to show patience and steadfastness on this path. You would need to show this patience and steadfastness because there's people who are trying to push you out of this path. And it is your duty to resist. It is your duty to strengthen your faith in Allah Azza wa and His revelations. The bottom line is that we as Muslims rely on these narrations. This is our religion. Allah has blessed this ummah with that, with the isnad. Why do I say this? Because you will find those people, the enemies of this religion, the haters of this religion, who raise doubts and skepticism about the whole Muslim heritage. They discredit this, this whole thing and they start making up alternative narratives of what happened to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And this is no secret. In the past, maybe we didn't need to talk about these kind of things. We talked straightforward or in Zul al-Wahi ala Rasulillah that he was revealed to. But now you have people who are trying to make you doubt this. But Alhamdulillah, if you look at the narrations and I've compiled a few here, Multiple Sahaba have attested to the various phenomena they witnessed with their own eyes. They lived. They've attested and bore witness to what they have seen with their own eyes, what they have lived with all their feelings and minds and hearts, what they have believed in to the extent that they've devoted their whole lives for because they've seen enough evidence during their lifetime with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that this religion has become mixed with their, with their blood because they have become so convinced from the multitude of signs that they saw in this man, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu his conduct, his, the miracles that they've seen, that Allah has shown on his hands to humanity. The legislations that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given to us through him the blessed teachings and the wisdom that he was the first one to apply everything that he taught that he was the role model in everything that nobody could keep up with his worship they tried sometimes to fast as much as he fasted but they couldn't and he would say to them you are not like me at night my lord gives me the strength allah doesn't when he fasted days on end without any breaking of the fast called the wisal which is not legislated for us but he had so much iman and connection with Allah even when he is sleeping that Allah gave him the strength to do things like this he did not need as much food or drink like other human beings did he said even when I sleep it is only my eyes, his body, his physical body goes to sleep. But his heart is still connected with Allah Azza wa Jal. So he would fast a week or two weeks without breaking the fast at all. No water and no food. This is all documented. Sahaba tried to do, but they couldn't keep up. Anyhow, so you have to trust this. 
And I say this because even some people who are known to be callers to Islam, and some people may consider them as Muslim scholars, but obviously they have weakness when it comes to, some of them have weakness when it comes to the matter of narration and the historical accuracy of the reports that came to us from those people who have narrated the, these things to us. For instance, Brother Yasser Qadi, and many of you know him, if he comes out, and you can see this video on the internet, and he says, the standard narrative has holes. The standard narrative is what the Sahaba told us, what the Tabi'een, what the Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi and Nasa'i have documented. So if you reject this narrative, what kind of narrative do you want to adopt? This is like me, for instance, I have, for instance, my ancestors and forefathers, and then my father comes and tells me stories about my ancestors. And they have documented generation after generation what those ancestors were, ancestors were doing, and their qualities and their conduct and their achievements. And then comes to me somebody who is the enemy of my family, from a totally different culture, from a totally different religion, from a totally different lo locality and even language, and starts providing me with stories about my ancestors that are totally different from what has been relayed to me, from my fathers and forefathers. Who do I trust? If I don't trust the narrative of the people who are the most trustworthy on earth, the people who know that this is their way to heaven, and if they divert out of this way, they are going to hell. من كذب علي متعمدا فليتبوء مقعده من النار. They have, they have narrated to us that the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم told us, whoever lies on me, whoever makes up lies about me, he should assume his seat in the fire of hell. Those are the people who would be afraid to utter a single word or substitute a, a word that has the same meaning of another word without indicating that they did so when they narrate to us the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa They would say, maybe he said this or maybe he said that. And he would, they would give you both words because they are so cautious about changing the meaning of what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told us. So do we trust those people or do we trust the enemies of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The enemies of Allah, the enemies of this religion, the people who resent this religion and hate it from the bottom of their hearts. How can some people start accepting those doubts and skepticism that those other people from other religions or atheists are trying to raise about those most trustworthy historical reports that alhamdulillah the Sahaba and Tabi'een and the followers of the Tabi'een have documented and authenticated and cross-checked million times between them and they have compiled them from every part of the Muslim world from the very far to the very east and then compared all these narrations to come to us to what exactly happened during the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah azza wa jalla wa Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa nusalli wa nusallimu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala jami'i al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. اللهم صل على محمد النبي وأزواجه وأمهات المؤمنين وذريته وآل بيته كما صليت على آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما and the fact that I pointed out somebody's name, that is okay because this is our religion. No matter who, if I say something wrong about this religion, you have to point me out and say, especially if I say it publicly, because the atheists and people who are fighting this religion are using these statements from such callers to Islam or Muslim scholars to use them against the religion of Allah. So we have to point such mistakes out and nobody is free of mistake. We start with the main hadith. And of course, I will not read the hadith in word by word because this is a khutbah, not a dars, it's not a regular teaching class. But I will give you the idea. The main hadith, when you are asked, what is the main hadith 
that tells us about the beginning of the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu It is a hadith in Bukhari narrated by Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha by his wife Aisha. And it starts like this. So she goes on and saying how the revelation started to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that initially he would receive dreams or visions when he's asleep and then when he would wake up and these things will come to be. And this was something that happened for quite some time. And that is, yes, some of us can see some dreams and they come, uh, come to life or you, they happen in reality. But not all our dreams, but whatever he saw in a vision, it would come kafalak as subh. Just like the day starts, it would happen. That was something peculiar about him. And then he used to go and seclude himself fi ghar hira in a mountain, in a cave called Ghar Hira. So he used to stay there one month every year because he wanted. He used to ponder in this universe. He wanted to know what this life and existence is about. And he had no guide in this. He didn't approve of all the different ways of life and the falsified religions around him and the pagan worship and sacrifice for idols and the, and the misconduct and that was happening around him and lack of morality and so on. So he used to seclude himself and ponder and pray to Allah, يتحنث, يتعبد, وهو التعبد. used to pray to Allah. Even if you don't have a specific religion, you know that there's a creator. You know, if you are lost, who to call upon to guide you. That's what he did. And he did this for several years. This shows you the quality of the human being he was. He was yearning to know what Allah wants from us. He wanted to know how to please this Lord. So, I kept on doing this, and this shows you that if you want something dearly from Allah, you have to persevere. You have to, you cannot stop doing it at one point. Say, don't say, okay, I want Allah to enlighten my heart and give me strong faith. Then you start praying for a month or two, and not, if nothing happens, then you stop doing what you were doing. Or you fast a few days, and then you start fasting because nothing has happened. Prophet Muhammad persevered for years doing th things like this, although he had no clear guidance at the time from Allah Azza wa Jal on what he should be doing. But he had this strong motivation inside him. Until she says, Until suddenly, it will come suddenly. Suddenly, if Allah chooses and sees from your heart that you really want him, that is when Allah, if an Allah chooses your heart and gives you this light, then your whole life will change. This moment when Allah chose this heart out of all humanity, He knew this was the cleanest heart out of all humanity, then He changed the face of this earth by this man, by this heart, because of how clean it was. So then He gave him this life. He sent him His angel, Jibreel, and you know the whole story, Iqra ma ana biqara. And Jibreel alayhi salam probably came to him in the form of a man. But yes, he was frightened because imagine being in a cave in the middle of the desert, in the darkness, nobody around you, and somebody comes to you like this, you don't know if he's going to kill you or what. So he was afraid. And Jibreel alayhi salam would hold him tight like this. Scholars say this is, was like to prepare him for what is coming, that he's going to work very hard, that he might suffer in this path. He showed him, this is a weighty speech that is coming to you. This is a very big message that has a great value that you need to work hard to be upright on this path and to call others, other people to it. And also so that he knows that he's not dreaming. He's not confused. He's not deluded. This is reality. He showed him that this is physical reality. He showed him this pressure. In some narrations, he says, I felt I was going to die from the tightness of this grip of this angel. And then, of course, Prophet Muhammad didn't know what was happening. He went back to his wife Khadija. 
he, his heart was trembling when this happened. And he was so cold and shivering. He said, Zam miluni, Zam miluni, cover me up, cover me up. This shows you because they try to shed doubts about all this. He himself did not know what was happening initially. Because they say, oh, he made things up. Look at what happened to him. Look at how much he suffered for him to bring you guys, bring us and all of humanity out of darkness to, to take us to our final abode of happiness and pleasure in heavens. So he suffered all this suffering. And then there are some people who have no manners with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu who have the audacity to claim that he's a liar or that he's making things up. Anyhow, she herself didn't know what was happening. But she knew that he was a good man. And this is her testimony for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah will never let you down. She said to him, you're such a good person. You help whoever is in need of help. You are nice to your, to your guests. You, whatever is difficult for people to do for others, you are the one who, who does it. Textable ma'adum. وتحمل الكل. And the weak you are helping. Allah is seeing all this. Allah will never let you down. You will be rewarded for this. Don't think something bad is happening to you. Still, she didn't know what was happening. So she takes him to somebody who has some knowledge about revelations. Waraqa ibn Nawfal, who was her cousin. And he was such an old man. He was so old that he had already lost his sight. But he had become a Christian at the pre -Islam, in the pre-Islamic era. And he was able to read from the Bible in Hebrew. So he was a learned man. And he knew about revelations and prophets and so on. So he took him, she took him to that expert. And he was the first one to tell him exactly what was happen, happening. He says, this is the same angel and this is the same phenomenon that happened to Musa alayhi salam. Prophethood, it's revelation. And then he told him about the reality of this path. He says to him, I wish I would be young. I wish I was young to support you. I wish I would be with you when your people drive you out of your town. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was surprised. He says, why would they drive me out of my town? What did I do? Because he didn't yet know what was going to happen and that there will be enemies and haters of this message. The shayateen al-insu al-jinn, the devils in humanity and the devils of the jinn, they don't like, they don't like cleanliness. They don't like purity. They don't like modesty. They don't, want, they don't, they don't like uprightness. They don't like righteousness. They want to live in the filth and drag us all into this filth. They want to drag our daughters, our wives into this filth. Take their hijab off. Talk, tell them, what is this hijab? They want us to have illicit sexual relationships like they do, like the animals. They don't want cleanliness. So Prophet Muhammad didn't yet know. But Warqa ibn Nawfal told him, he says, Awa are they going to, this going to happen to me? He says, yes. ما أتى أحد بمثل ما أتيت به إلا عودي. says whenever you are on this religion and any prophet who came before you there was enemies for him. وكذلك جعلنا لكل نبي عدوا شياطين الإنس والجن. الله سبحانه. and that is why when you see somebody who claims to be a Muslim scholars and the enemies of Islam like him you have to know that he is not on the path. he cannot be better from the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. If he was on the path of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they, would take, they would take him as his enemy, just like they did with the Prophet Muhammad Inshallah, we'll stop here. Continue, inshallah, next